Some guys really like Batman, and they had an epiphany. So they all got to work on the next Batman movie. And now they are the heroes, and you get to follow along. They're bringing him to life every week after this song. Batman, Project Batman, Project Batman. Fuck yeah. All right. <laughs> Time for Project Batman. <laughs> Actually, speaking of Star Trek and trying to get into Batman, in rewatching Star Trek twice, I thought of something that is could potentially be very relevant to our movie. Over the past few episodes, and really since the beginning, we've been so adamant about uh, listing all of the very specific effects of the Abaddon serum. And like, that was uh, that was actually just what I was going to say, was that's what I want to do this episode. Okay, well, before we get into that, and yes, by all means, let's do that. But let me preface it by saying this. In Star Trek, the reason that movie is so perfect is because of the characterization, mm-hmm. and we care about the journey of those characters and the conflict that they are mentally involved in. Meanwhile, there's this stuff that's a big plot point of the movie that they never really talk about called Red Matter. Yeah. It just has a simple name like that, and because we're so involved with the characters, we never, ever, ever once question the science of it. They just have like maybe two offhand lines of dialogue about what it does, and we just see it happen, and we accept it. And we accept it because... We're seeing Spock react to his plant being destroyed. Exactly. We're in his head. So I think that worked because they didn't spend time on it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't know how our MacGuffin works. We definitely should. Mm-hmm. But what I'm saying is with fake science in a movie, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how realistic it is because if your story is good with your characters, the audience will buy it. That's the whole point I took from, not the whole point, but one of the big revelations I took from, like, watching Star Trek again. Because, like, now as I get more into writing, everything I watch, especially if I'm rewatching it, I'm just focusing on the writing. Right. I was I was that way with special effects for a little while when I started, uh, um, I had this book called The D.V. Rebel's Guide, and also... Uh, uh, Robert Rodriguez's diary that he kept when he was making El Mariachi, which is actually downstairs. But yeah, that happened to me too when I was, yeah, you know, I was started looking at films in a different way just because of shit I was working on. Mm-hmm. But you know, allow me to retort. Okay. Okay, I agree with what you're saying on the Star Trek thing, but at the same time, we've actually gone so much into this Abaddon thing that it's almost become a character in itself. Yeah. That's true. And that was that was what I wanted to do, is give it almost a character treatise. I get that. And, I mean, even if, even if it doesn't come up itself a lot in the movie, for our own reference purposes, we need to know mm-hmm. what's going on with it for... If for no other purpose than just, you know, simple story structure. Right. They, uh, I might have said this before, and I might not have, so forgive me if I have, but, like... Uh, season five of Lost is the time travel season, mm-hmm. and um, they said they spent like weeks before even getting into writing individual episodes and being like, "This is what happens in this episode." They spent weeks just like because every time travel story is different, like uh, making up all their rules for like how their time travel will work and how it will serve their story. And when it got to the point of, like, it being on the page or a line in the show. Like, there's one line in the show, I think, about a rule that is um, anything we're touching when we jump through time that travels with us. And that's the only thing that stuck that they had to explain to the audience from weeks of preparation of trying to understand it. Everything else was just for their for the writers to try to understand 
the world they were working in. And I guess it was still necessary because it turned out to be a great season and all the time travel stuff worked. But it's just, it's interesting and funny how little you have to explain to the audience. Right. Okay. So, so, you, so you wanted to make, you wanted to treat the Abaddon as a character for this episode. Right. I, for Especially for, like, writing purposes more than anything. I'm thinking it's... I'm, I'm thinking, it, at least how the movie's played out in my head so far, what it's actually going on and doing is touched on in Act 2 and 3. Especially when... Uh, there needs to be something of it because the reason Clock King and Ubu are going to go blow Batman shit up is because Raish knows that he managed to get a sample of the stuff. Mm. And so there's got to be at least some sort of vague reference to it going on because they're trying to blow it up, at least as, at least how we have the story iterated now. Right. I had a weird idea earlier. I don't know if I like the idea or if I really hate the idea, so I'm just going to throw it out there, and if you think it's stupid, let me know. So the way we have it is, like, the first time we see the Abaddon serum, like, the effects of it is in France when it kills millions of people. And we also have that very... First, I guess it's the second scene technically where uh, Rache is in 2009 waiting to kill Paris just looking at the map you know yeah. um, and then Ubu like brings him a sample of the Abaddon and then they're like get ready for some shit <laughs> <laughs> what if in that scene like Rache tested it on a subject like had someone there that like he just wanted to see the effects of it and he want for like maybe the first time that's a good idea i like it and like maybe somebody's in like, like a, a captive yeah like in like a glass like airproof chamber and they just like drop it in there close it up and then that's when we see like the the ball like sort of on impact uh Melt or whatever we said it would, because it's like we'll this, that's what we'll discuss is yeah how it's and distributed. Then, and then like we just see like um, and it, the fact that they're just pumping it into a glass cage means that it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily have to have the same deploy mechanism. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, they could just have a pump with it into a glass case. Uh huh. Because doesn't he hand him a vial of the shit? What if he just sticks the vial in a hole in the thing and it breaks on the fucking floor? Right. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Or we could, again, because, I mean, I, I I will always tend to think towards not showing too much too soon. Um, possibly, like, showing that he has someone captive and then have Ubu hand him the uh, orange vial. Have it happen off screen? Yeah, and then just see him, like put it in there and then like it'll just be a shot of Rach like watching someone die or scream or something I like that that's that sounds very Rach and then yeah we don't see what happens to them and then Paris scene millions of people die we see gas but we don't really see what happens to them and then the later scene in the next place where we see everyone die (laughs) I'm thinking. I'm, okay, so I'm thinking how this how this would be structured is that we see the people captive and we see the gas start to get into the cage, just so there's that visual cue of the gas, and that's something just a quick visual thing for the audiences to connect later. Mm-hmm. And so they'll be like, "Oh, you just detonated this shit in an entire city because it apparently worked so well on your captive." It just a just a quick visual cue, I think, would work. Well, visual shit like we also have to keep in mind the style of the animated series, just in general, and they do a lot of shit like that. Yeah. So we don't see what the gas does; we just see the gas happen, and then we watch, and then we see Rish watching the guy die. All right. So we don't want the gas to be the sight of gas to be a surprise in Paris. Right, 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 right. 
It's just the, just, just we're sim- in Paris. We're just simply reacting to the fact the scale. That, yeah. Okay. I that's it. that's what the Paris thing is for. Is the utter scale of a popula- of a city with a population of something to the tune of three million is wiped out in an instant. Right. And you're still not very clear on why that happened. Right. <laughs> okay. I'm down with that. Okay. So let's talk about the Avedon enzyme. What is it? From what I remember of us having it down so far is that the the Avedon enzyme is the combination of the enzymes from the Lazarus pit reverse engineered using the cure for the Black Plague, which weaponizes it and upon being distributed as a gas, bonds with human blood and lethally ages the host. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, I would like to note, I saw an episode, or like a snippet out of an episode of the animated series the other day, um, that there was an episode with Poison Ivy where Alfred and his vaguely hinted at being girlfriend Maggie Mm -hmm. went to this some sort of day spa and were turned into plants by Captain Planet (laughs) yeah Captain Planet came turned them into fucking trees that's so funny I just watched a funnier die skit about Captain Planet Don Cheadle (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's awesome did you see the whole thing there, there's five of them, I think. No. Watch no. all five. Okay. It's great. Okay. There's a whole story arc to it. Okay. <laughs> it degenerates into him becoming some sort of totalitarian overlord of the planet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so... But in that, the thing that they were turning people into plants with reacted with human blood. I'm thinking, if that's mentioned at all in the movie... Batman would make the connection. I've seen this before. Okay. So, so Bat so Batman in that in that episode you're referring to, he's aware he, of how he it is works. he's sitting there in his lab and he pours I, he's actually talking to like a tape recorder. I am now mixing equal parts of whatever the fuck it is with human plasma. And then the vial fucking fills with a goddamn tree that starts attacking him. And so he's like, Oh, that's what that does. Neat. <laughs> Hey, right. <laughs> that's cool. But I'm thinking that's that would make the most sense for how it how it's activated. But if that is mentioned as to how that works, it should be noted that Batman has seen a similar thing before. He would make a comment on that. Right. Would people live that are in their homes or would it just No, it's that's in the air. Let, yeah, let's t- let's talk about that though. How can one defend against it? Because, like, I'm thinking there was that scene where there, where Batman and Talia are actually in a city that's being attacked right now. Mm-hmm. Or the, that we had an idea brainstormed about. And they escape it via the Batwing. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking the Batwing gets engulfed by the cloud, but because they're not in... But because the, the Batwing, I'm guessing, has... It's sealed. Right. Because I believe he can take the Batwing underwater in emergency situations. I think he's yeah, done that. Yeah, once. it's been underwater. So basically, if you can keep yourself from getting exposed to it, we can start closing shit. Now, yeah, I was, I, I was actually just going to do that. Um, oh, and by that, I mean creepy. you guys close shit. It's creepy. The shadow of that tree it looks like a ghost. Like it is a ghost. Oh, that's Jeff. That's more of a reason to close it. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it though it wouldn't matter just float through it I guess <laughs> anyway um, so I'm thinking if you can avoid direct exposure to it you can uh, you can avoid being killed by it so like Batman and Talia discover like a family in their like fucking cellar who is smart enough to get in there Possibly, possibly. What happened here? Said Keanu Reeves as Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the problem is he's driving the, uh, the Batmobile and he can't slow down. 
because otherwise it'll explode. Oh, right. So, if you can avoid direct exposure to it, it can't kill you. It took me a second to realize you were making a speed joke, and just because I learned this today, I'm going to bring it up. Joss Whedon rewrote Speed. I think I actually did know that. Speed has been one of my favorite movies for years, and I never knew that. It's uh, he's uncred- I think I actually did know that. He's uncredited, but yeah. Although, Speed 2. Never what saw happened? it. No Keanu. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was it. <laughs> okay. That's, and this is something I'd like to bring up. The Beyond Bat Suit can seal itself. Has it, that's happened? Or we're going to make it happen? That has happened. Like, he has the ability to breathe underwater. The eye, his eyes are not directly exposed to the air. There's stuff in front of his eyes. The white thing is actually, that's an, that's an HUD. Right. So it's not actually, like, his eyes. Like, on the, like on the bat suit, that's just some weird cartoon thing but in in the show it's established that his eyes aren't directly contacting the air the only thing that is is his mouth Mm -hmm. the uh suit is also shown to have very good radiation shielding terry mcginnis doesn't die of cancer when hitting when getting hit directly with a nuclear blast from blight it's also it also has to be sealed because you're able to stand in fire wearing the suit. This happened in the final episode of Batman Beyond, where he's walking through flames. Okay. The suit does have the ability to seal itself. That combined with, you know, like, the respirator that he uses underwater, which is established. There's no... There's nothing where he... There's nothing that directly says, hey, he can seal himself against gases. But combining all the other suit's features, it's obvious that he can. Right. And so... If need be, and he's in the Beyond suit, he could actually stop himself from getting killed. That would be awesome. And um, in the climax, you know how you have that scene where before he gets to the fortress, he flies up to the fucking uh, uh, plane that's going to go attack, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, What if in that plane, like, the way he... No... No, no, no. Throw it out there. I want to see it. It's not going to work. <laughs> because it would work for any other superhero or any other action scene. But in this instance, I was just thinking the most badass thing, which would end up killing people. I was just going to say... crash the plane into the fortress or well, whatever? No, I was going to say, like, like whatever, like... When we'll, I'm sure we'll get to discussing how, whether it's dropped as like they carpet bomb it with like a bunch of little things that dissolve and a bunch of smoke comes out or it's one big thing but like if it was just like one it was like if it was a bunch of little bombs he could like grab one of those and like activate it inside the plane to like save himself or something if he was in a moment of like did i tell you the idea that i had for like the whole scene i think so yeah, basically, he flies up there, he grabs the guy, he punches him out, and then pulls his parachute ripcord, and he flies off in the wind. Right, Away yeah. from the plane. And then, like, he flies the plane up, and, and then they shoot it down with machine guns, but then Batman flies through, and right, he gets out, and he starts kicking people's asses. Yeah. Like, immediately, because he does that. But, anyway. Can I, so, can I ask a question? Hmm. Uh, because I haven't seen it, and because you brought it up a second ago. How does Batman Beyond end? Um, it's not really an ending episode. It was an episode, it was the final episode that they happened to have. It wasn't meant as a final episode. Uh. The plot of the episode is that, the plot of the episode is actually very similar to scenes in both incarnations of the Spider-Man movies, and it actually, I think it happened prior to either of them, was that there was a kid that he was caught on top of a burning building. And Batman went up to save him, and the kid wouldn't go because he was scared of Batman. And Terry's just like, oh, fuck it, and he takes off his mask just to show that he's a normal guy. Which I believe both, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, I, I know that the new Spider-Man did that. I'm pretty sure Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man did that at some point, too. I fucking hated the new Spider-Man. I remember you saying something about that. Huh? It just wasn't the same. I didn't really like the other ones either. But... <laughs> <laughs> but 
But basically, and what happened was some guys found out that he saw Batman, and they had this mind-reading equipment, and they were trying to get a picture of Batman's face so they know who he fucking was. And, well, as it turns out, when they finally do get to him, when they when they read his mind, they read what the boy thought he saw, and he saw his favorite hero from TV. And so they're like, God damn it. That's awesome. This is ruined. And then Batman comes in and fucks all their shit up. That's awesome. But they, uh... That's that's the final episode of Batman Beyond. How it ends chronologically is Justice League Unlimited out, uh, epilogue. Right, right, right. And that's that's the end of that story. That's the episode that they wanted to do but didn't get to. Right. I think. But, anyways, back to Abaddon. Yeah, you were talking about the mask sealing him. Yeah, that, that kid... If need be, Batman, at least when he's in the Beyond suit, can seal himself from... The, the enzyme and it won't kill him of course it's not going to save everyone around him there's no way he could possibly stop that from happening to Talia unless he were to just pull the Iron Man glove fist everyone get on pepper thing but anyway the uh, what else can you do to stop Abaddon I don't know but could we get <laughs> this is dumb we're not going to do this, but I just had a dumb thought. What if uh, the Abaddon had some sort of, as it, as it, uh, as, cause it's a gas, it raises, uh, what if it had some sort of effect on the, get really political, have some sort of effect on the atmosphere? No, because then we would become Birdemic, and that movie was awful. Well, it was <laughs> awful because it was a bad story. But it was also awful. Okay. Also, I guess Raish wouldn't do anything that would affect the planet. Yeah, but yeah, there's that. That's another thing that's established. I don't know if it's going to be important plot-wise, and I pretty much guarantee that it's not, but we have brought it up before. Abaddon only affects humans. Yeah. It mm-hmm. does not affect any other kind of life. And we had a reason that it doesn't affect animals. I wonder if I noted it. It was, uh, I remember, it was something to do, I think how we wrote it was that because it the reactant chemical is human plasma but mm-hmm. I, I could there could be there could have been another reason for that. that I mean that sounds good to me in this moment I'm just going to check and see if we wrote something if we had something else if I noted it but yeah it only affects people doesn't hurt any animals doesn't hurt any trees and of course Raish not wanting to hurt anything on the planet would design it this way um, it's actually said that the Lazarus Pit wouldn't do that either. The Lazarus Pit doesn't affect anything that isn't people. We wrote, Bruce is curious as to why the gas killed humans but didn't hurt any animals. He takes an animal back to the Batcave to it, assess and extract the serum from their bloodstream to learn that it only works on humans. There you go. That's right. That's right. We did have that. Like, that was, like, he was, we said something about him being frustrated and not being able to figure something out, and then being, like, him, like, just looking up, like, confused or something, and then seeing a bird, or or just anything, and being, like, why is that still here? Mm-hmm. Or, like, if he does find a family in the cellar of somewhere, it could be a little kid that's just worried about his dog, and then Bruce could be, like, I'm sorry, your dog, who is out in all of this, and then they go out to check everything out. But there's the dog, and the kid's happy, and that triggers Bruce to, like, why did the dog survive? What if the dog's just sitting there watching TV like nothing happened? <laughs> and then Bruce is like, what's your dog's name? Ace? Isn't that his dog's name? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That could just be where he got the name from. I like I like the where we thought he got it from better. <laughs> Oh yeah, where do we think you got it from? The uh, uh, the girl in epilogue. Oh yeah, okay, I remember. But yeah, let's see. So doesn't affect animals, and that's how we can obtain a sample of it. It also degrades quickly in air. It's designed to one so that it doesn't spread outside of its target zones very far, and two leaves no evidence. 
That's another thing. He, Raish does not want to leave evidence. Right. So so let's let's discuss how how it's distributed. That's okay. Now I was thinking um, we had talked a couple of episodes ago about having the release mechanism being it's like frozen into balls or something like that, and then when those drop, they start melting. Maybe some it melts its way out of something that's similar to wax or something like that. We said it was like an organic skin that melted or that dissolved upon impact. Something like that. And then I realized, they're dropping this shit from airplanes. It's going to dent stuff. Hmm. People would notice the dents. Unless it's just like squishy. Yeah, even so, you drop a water balloon from high enough, it's going to dent stuff. Yeah, I guess so. But, especially people. Right. People are very dentable, I found. You might want to strike that from the podcast. I don't want anybody to know about those incidents. What? They haven't found the bodies yet. Wait, what? Oh. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on about some spiel about how I killed people with water balloons. Oh. Well, I was watching this I documentary see. last month, and this guy um, put a giant dome over Springfield. And <laughs> <laughs> hey. I love that movie. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> this documentary. I love that, um, just because they're my favorite band, I gotta bring them up. That when Green Day is on stage doing the da 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 da. That was da, awesome. Da. There's the teleprompter that just says da 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 <laughs> da da. And also, when the next scene is their funeral, and she's playing American Idiot funeral version on the, on the, <laughs> that's what it says on the, on the, um, all of us, their like little stage barge was going down. They did the Titanic thing. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so awesome movie. So distribution. Matt brought up something that I think could work if we made some severe edits to it, but I think we brought this up a couple of episodes about how pretty much all major cities are located on a river. Mm-hmm. And have the rivers be... So he, he had this idea for a shot of like this cloud of Abaddon rushing up a riverfront like a tidal wave. But he was thinking, distribute it through the water supply somehow. That reminds but me of Batman Begins. That was exactly where I went with it. I do kind of like the shot of... If we can get the distribu- if we can get our distribution mechanism to work with that shot of it rushing up the river, I think they were good because that's a fucking terrifying shot. But but gas doesn't go that way; it goes up. Let's discuss that. Okay. Because it might not. Think about it. If the gas always rises and they're deploying it from airplanes, how the fuck is it going to get down to the city? So it's like more of a fog. That, that's why it was like a impact release bomb. That's why I mean that's why we picked that before. But it, it, he brings up a good point though too with it with it being like a fog. There's something that sort of hovers in the air and then just dissipates on its own. Hmm. But something that hangs out where people tend to be elevated at. But it would also have to work well enough to get to people in skyscrapers because there are people in them and he wants to kill those people. Right. But I kind of like the the whole drop from the mini bombs thing, but at the same time, let's try and think of a way for a single airplane to get something to work over... An entire city. Because you have to remember, these cities that these things are destroying are like, you know, 40 miles across. Right. So maybe, could the plane deploy something that pretty much just shoots missiles out in every direction? And then the missiles explode, and the trails of the missiles, along with the explosions of the missiles themselves, are enzyme? Maybe? I don't know, it really doesn't seem his speed, though, does it? Uh, Yeah, that seems too destructive. 
If it were something... like like the missiles aren't hitting anything, they're air bursts. Mm. Or like yeah, or just like as they zoom through the air, they dissolve and like it releases as it goes. Yeah, something like that. Um, that's an idea, and I mean, going back to our first incarnation of of this when I wrote it was it just one larger item that just again going back to the red matter star trek uh example just one thing that releases gas and there's an an emotional effect that we don't think about and then that one thing that releases the gas maybe that is the evidence and since again i'm i'm just spitballing here but um since the since he expects everybody in the city to be dead it doesn't matter that that one thing of evidence is there and that could be batman's thing that he finally finds like in this giant city there's one thing to find that emits all of it but again that's hard to argue that it would spread across a whole city but on the other hand, we might not have to argue it if it affects the viewer on an emotional level. The other thing... I, I, I'm leaving this decision to you. Because, <laughs> this because is a hard one. It, it really is. It I really always keep thinking of that uh, Laughing Fish episode with the garbage barge thing and mm-hmm. then the smoke. Yeah. That's what I keep thinking of. You remember that episode? Mm-mm. He, uh, uh, the Joker started... Um, Poisoning all the fish with Joker gas in order to make everyone buy his smiling fish. And something like that. And how he was distributing Joker gas was he actually was, he was having it, it didn't he have like disguised garbage barges or something? Something that, yeah, it was, you, you know, the garbage barges that, that were disguised and they just spit Joker gas. But that's the thing, is it the reason I'd want it I was thinking for a moment multiple airplanes for releasing Abaddon, but the thing is, is that the thing itself has to be not noticeable. No one's gonna really bat an eye about a single airplane flying around. I just had another opposed idea. To a fleet. Okay. Um and this is getting semi political again. But what if race doesn't care about his followers. At this point, he only cares about his mission, and he just has tons of people in vehicles planted all over the city just to drive in. Your job, your job, uh, uh, League of Shadow person, what's it called? League, or the uh, Society of Shadows. Your this. job, Society of Shadow person number 486, is to drive to this part of the city and just sit there, and you don't know why you're sitting there in this vehicle that I assigned you with, and when I, here at my fortress, press this button, it emits this gas, and you die, but you're not going to know it. And that's a very terrorist thing to do. It is Iron Man 3. That's very reminiscent of that. Maybe not with the truck thing so w- much. Wait, what am, I not th- what am I not remembering from Iron Man 3? The terrorist... Making the extremist guys go to places and then causing them to explode. Right. Again, though, that's... They didn't come up with that in Iron Man 3. That's just a comment on what happens in the world. Mm Mm-hmm. But the, um... But I'm still... I'm still really liking an aerial approach to this. I am I'm just trying to figure out how to do this. With a, um... That is weird, though. I was just thinking the same thing. A terrorist? Yeah, because I like, just got done watching the beginning of Die Hard 5, and that's almost exactly how that starts out. Oh, really? I've got something that could work as inconspicuous. Okay. An airplane. Ghosts. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a tree ghost. Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What if he had some sort of decoy birds or something that he released from the airplane and those were the distribution mechanism and then the Abaddon itself gets rid of those and doesn't leave anything better 
You're know. getting closer into something. I like I'm, I like that. And the little French boy is like, Mommy, Mommy, the bird will let me pick it up. Look. Kill his family. Kill his Paris. Could be, could be. Or... How many fucking birds would that take? He's got a point. It'd take millions more than... But that could be a cool image. But I'm, I'm thinking all, that... Could all be like ravens. Dude! <laughs> we went to the zoo, and I saw a raven for what I guess is the first time. I never knew how fucking huge those things are. I thought they... I, this might make me dumb. I literally thought a raven was synonymous with crow. But it's like this big <laughs> like sitting there like like wings like in like not like that like it's it's huge it blew my mind <laughs> just saying fucking bird big ass bird yeah and it was just like on a tree staring at me and I was like never more <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to make a joke I was waiting for you to go in with that Allan Poe thing I knew you would anyway um my brother got attacked by an emu once my cousin got attacked by an emu. Once. Emus are evil. They are. It's it said not to stick your hands in the cage. My cousin was like he stuck ah. his face up to it and got pecked in the eye. Yeah, my cousin got his finger like like it bit his finger and was bleeding. Ah, oh, birdie. That's an emus. <laughs> anyway, um, a flock of emus. <laughs> do they flock? Is that what they do? They're uh. They're flocking this way. <laughs> Gala, <Gala> Mimus. <laughs> um Look at all that blood. <laughs> Look at all that Abaddon. Okay, so I had an interesting thought that I'm not sure if it would work. A yeah. couple of a couple of minutes ago. What if upon each person that is killed? With the Abaddon serum, as it ages them into oblivion, it also creates more Abaddon. Like they explode and more Abaddon dust comes out, or Abaddon gas? Something like that, yeah. Use the people themselves as... (laughs) Or it's like... As the mechanism. Or it's like just one Abaddon thing drops... And like whoever's in that surrounding area gets infected it's hit by it, and then it just and then it becomes going. a zombie movie too. Where there's is that people. is that where is that where that's leading you? Uh, sort of. Okay, but I mean, it doesn't have to. That was just my first thought. They get infected. They're all aging. And they're like, oh, help me, family, and they just like go to their family to like help or someone else to help them, and whoever they touch, that makes them the same way. And then they start aging. And then, I mean, yeah, that's weird. And it's sort of like mixing. It it's mixing. Forever. It's mixing genres, it's, but it's kind of neat. Yeah, it would take a really long time, and that that would leave witnesses. Yeah. All right. Let's 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 for a moment. Um, how hat? Because I know you you take issue with with quote unquote stealing from other movies, but. Everything is taken from something else. If that weren't true, Quentin Tarantino would have never made a movie ever. (laughs) So, um, let's think of all the mass deaths we've ever seen that we can think of right now in movies or comics or whatever. There is zombies. There's... I saw a school bus full of kids get set on fire. I was thinking of that too. (laughs) Wait, what's that? Uh, hobo with a shotgun. Oh, low budget it. movie starring low budget Rooker Hauer. <laughs> you had to put in the low budget Rooker Hauer. <laughs> it really Remember is. When you were respectable. In like 1980, when was Blade Runner? Three? <laughs> 1983 or something? Damn. Did he do anything after that? Man, if someone believes in the project though, they'll they'll do it for nothing. Think about how amazing and still relevant John Goodman is. And then, oh, yeah. and then think about the fact that Red State's entire budget was $2 million. Huh. Kevin Smith says if we knew 
the exact number John Goodman got paid for Red State, we would write him a check and send it to him. <laughs> that was a decent movie, too. I liked it. I like it a lot, yeah. Um, there was also, of course, Nuclear Weapons, which... And the thing thought to me, keeping it simple, is just a very large boom cloud bomb thing. Yeah. That could just create a very large cloud that would spread out over... I mean, that would work, and bombs tend not to leave a lot of evidence of themselves. So in um, in Injustice, the game, mm-hmm. Lex Luthor has this move that where he just sort of like... He like presses something on his arm because he's in like this big mechanical suit and, yeah and, and then just points in front of him and a giant like laser comes down from the sky and like hits that area that's cool um what if it's something like a controlled like like beam that can move and just wipe people out because that was the plot of return of the joker you're right, it was. God damn it. <laughs> but it's not a laser. We're doing gas. Controlled gas. Be- <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like the closest we've come to originality and solving our problems of getting an entire city without leaving any ev- evidence is are those organic containers that uh, dissolve... And they're sort of like carpet bombed. And while I I get your argument against leaving dents and shit... Maybe that's not as big a deal. Again, red matter argument. Nobody's going to think about it because of the emotional impact. Okay. So let's say say for a minute that we're going with that. What are the little things that they're deployed in? I'm thinking something about bocce ball sized. And I I like the idea of it sort of melting through it. I was almost thinking what if it was just a frozen chunk of the stuff and it sublimates like dry ice. It's like dry ice turns directly from That's a really good idea. I like that a lot actually. And like I just picture like the way we have it in the script right now of like the kid like something falls in front of the kid, he looks down, he picks it up, and like as it dissolves and the gas starts to emit Hundreds of others start falling around him, and he just looks around, and then aerial shot of the gas. But yeah, I was, I was thinking something, you know, something along the lines of dry ice, where it just—I mean, it's frozen CO two, and it doesn't liquefy; it just it sublimates is the technical term. Yeah, that's. I like that idea. It just would happen, have it, it would just have to happen quickly. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's. Uh, Something with, like, he figured out how to get it to, you know, it freezes at a relatively mediocre temperature, you know, something that's not really cold, uh-huh. but something that's not really hot, so you could use it on, like, you'd use it on, like, uh, you know, cities in the north or whatever, and it'd still work. Right. Right. Not that, not that there's much, not that there's all that much population above, like, that those latitude lines but that's interesting i'm i'm just trying to i'm just trying to imagine how to visually make that happen quickly and interesting like he picks it up and it's like this just orange ball and yeah i was i was saying he he sees it just start to sort of sublimate and then like right as he sees that and and it's established that that gas is there then you can establish a larger shot of the gas. Right. This is something that really bugs me is that Jason really hates this one shot that we have for the trailer. The shot where you see Paris engulfed in in the gas. Mm-hmm. And then you see a wide shot of the earth and you see the gas all over the place. You know, coming from you know where several major cities are. Mm-hmm. And he's like, how are people going to connect those two things? How, that, that shot doesn't make any sense. How are they going to think that this gas is the same gas here? I disagree. 
I don't understand why he... Do you understand why he finds that a problem? No. I thought you did. No. My problem was, uh, the only thing I had trouble with was actually just when it came to drawing it, and I was figuring out where to make it look like the gas was. But uh, we, oh. fi- we figured that one out. Um, I've got... And for future reference, if you if you ever having trouble with that, again... They just took a bunch of pictures today of the ISS. There's a volcano erupting in Alaska, and they have pictures of it erupting from space. Cool. And it is pretty much just what you would expect if a large amount of some sort of gas, in this case smoke, were Wouldn't that emitted just be into cool the if you atmosphere. Could, like conjure up natural disasters. <laughs> be like, here's a fucking volcano. Eat eat shit. <laughs> um, but- I'm just gonna leave this here for you guys. By by the way, um, they uh, I'm always trying to get uh, you on on Twitter, and here's another argument for it. I'm trying to figure out his fucking name. Chris Hadfield. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got his Facebook. Oh, okay, but he's and I'm he's like to his YouTube. He's always tweeting like all day, just cool shots of like what he's doing in space at that moment and shit. All right, I thought you didn't care for the space stuff. I care about Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I love immediacy, and I don't know. Like sometimes I have I, to come over when I have that damn thing set up outside and see so neat shit. If if I can just like click on something for a second and see something cool and short, I'm happy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not against space stuff. It's my favorite fictional setting. <laughs> um, but I, I had a cool idea, by the way, for. Um, I didn't get it written out because I had a lot of shit going on the past two weeks, but um, we said our next scene after the first act would be Raish uh, saying, uh, uh, well, y- your lines in the last podcast that I edited were, were him saying, um, well, Paris seemed to go over as planned. Let's get six more cities. Um, but how how much more fucked up is it for him to be like, Along the lines of Paris went over well. How much more do we have? And and then whoever's like, I guess Ubu is like, we have enough for six more cities. And then he's like, use all of it, make more. <laughs> That's all. I know it's a little thing, but I thought that was cool. That could work. That could work. But okay, so we've got. Distribution. We've got. Yeah, I mean, is that is that what we've decided on for the moment? Is the sublimating gas thing is dropped by the aeroplanes? That's the most uh, logical for our needs and or ri- and simultaneously original idea. I think we've had. Okay. Um, and we've got how it reacts to people and animals. We also need to come up with how it reacts to race, because that's important. How I had the rough draft of that scene written was that upon entering the bloodstream of somebody with the Lazarus Pit enzyme already in them, Abaddon and, and Lazarus sort of fight each other but neither can really get the upper ground on each other, thus making someone completely immune to either. Which puts them in a state of... Complete and utter mortality. Okay. So just normal. Pretty much just normal, yeah. But because he's so old, he automatically ages. Right, 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 right. It it no longer makes him ageless. What I was thinking also... And I don't know how this would work, but I was still thinking maybe people are going to go a little ape shit because it kind of looks like Batman killed somebody here. We, haven't we? Uh... We discussed that, and I'm I'm still I'm still for that. But I'm I'm still th- I had a thought today, and I wonder if this works. And I'll run it by you guys. What if, as Batman hits him? With the stuff, Raish 
goes to attack him again or something, and Talia shoots him. Like in the chest. And that might have some more reciprocity for okay. Talia wanting to stay with him. Like she feels guilty about it? Right. Like she she just does it out of an emotional reaction to protect Batman and then is like, oh fuck, dad, what can I do to help? Something like that. Not, yeah. not literally those are the lines, but, but that's but, No, I, I know what you meant. But like somehow choreograph that in where it's actually, you know, Batman defeats him. But Talia kills him. Right. Um, that could work. Another argument would be, if people are flipping out about that, then that's them saying they would have been fine with dying. Because while Batman was really adamant about not killing anybody in Gotham, these stakes are a lot higher. Like, this man is literally on his way to wiping out every person on the planet. And that has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And and I liked your line about... Um, uh, Batman can snap. Yeah, he can. But but he all you also wrote a line that was Batman legitimizing his actions, which was Rache says to Batman, "This is impossible. You don't kill people." Batman replies, "I didn't kill you. I just finally stopped your ability to stave off death. Your own serum is being staved off by your years of relying on the Lazarus Pit. But it will catch up to you." It's true that it's true that I made a vow never to take a life. Old age hasn't done the same. So, uh, yeah. And then you had a different version of that <laughs> that line somewhere else. But um, I liked the idea of Batman saying, "No, this is allowed. I'm allowed to do this because you've cheated death for so long. You should have been dead by now." The uh, the one thing. It the other reason was I was trying to make it to where Raish was going to die, like, soon, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be, like, an outright murder. And here's the reason why. Because if Bruce isn't going to kill him outright, he's going to at least apprehend him. Yeah. I mean, he's not going to... like. Unless he knows... If he knows he's going to die right there as a result of his actions, he's just consciously killed somebody outright. And even if that is justified, I still think it's out of character for him. Okay. But if he does it and he knows it's going to take a long time and he's uncertain of as of when, he's going to try and take Raish in, which ruins the following scene of the thing with Talia. Right. Who who would you even take in the United the, Nations? Oh. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> I thought of it. <laughs> right. Um what if he just sort of No, I don't know how I can make that work. It, shoot it our way maybe we can make it work I was just going to say what if Bruce somehow had him you know chained up or just in some position where he thought Raish could no longer do anything and Raish has some sort of voice command thing or or while Bruce is like taking care of no see it's not going to work never mind Never mind. I was just going to make, like, Talia stop Raish from doing something that Batman didn't see Raish was doing while his back was turned, but in that version of what I was thinking, Batman was stopping the Abaddon serum <laughs> from spreading, but I had forgotten in the moment that Talia had already taken care of that, so never mind. Um, okay, so, and this is, this is still important to this Abaddon plotline, Without Talia holding a gun to him, which she has done in the past, but I don't think she would do at this point, what would make Batman accept leaving Talia with Raish as opposed to taking him to the United Nations? 
I mean, there's that little exchange there, and that pisses him off. But being pissed off isn't enough to legitimize him leaving. Batman swore to defend Gotham. He stopped the world from ending. He thinks Raish is about to die anyway because of this aging thing. I mean, that that's the way that's I That's what I assumed, yeah. He assumed he was going to die anyway, so no point sticking around. Yeah, he's like, I just stopped your ability to stave off death. You're, you're ready to look at you. You're aging. Yeah. Because once... Remember we had that cool visual of, like, once their bodies were transferred, Talia steps out, or Rage steps out in Talia's body and looks over at his own body, which just dusts out of age. So he's on his way there. And Batman could probably see that happening in the moment as soon as the effects start to take place from what from everything that just went down. Maybe maybe Batman's like he doesn't legitimately know if Raish will survive or not. Or maybe, I don't know. Or I, I was just thinking he was sure Raish was, was sure about to die. die. Yeah. Like he's just, I mean, he was back in the cave. He's did all his science. I mean, from what he could tell, Raish was aging. But make it to where it's, as long as Bruce knows it would be the old age that kills him and not his introduction of Abaddon. Right. I mean, I think that little speech thing that you gave him right there says it all. Yeah, like, like Raish has lived much longer than a lifetime. He's lived many, many lifetimes and ended many more than that. Like, it's, it's illegit, like, in Bruce's, I just in, got in it. Bruce's, I'm not gonna kill people argument, it's because they deserve their life. Right. They deserve to make up for their life. Raish has had a lifetime and more than enough of them to see the error of his ways. I just figured out how this works also. And the reason for the the rapid aging and the fact that Bruce knows that the old age would kill him is because Raish looks like he's what? 50s? Yeah. Yeah. And yet we see him multiple times where he has aged a lot in the manner of, like, a year. Like, the Lazarus pit stopped working for him because he was so used to using it. Mm -hmm. And it was in the period of, like, a year that he showed up in the Superman animated series, he aged 30 years in, like, a year. I mean, it looked like he was in, like, his 90s or something. Mm. So maybe it's... Maybe all Batman's doing is allowing that to take place. Yeah. Okay, okay. That's how we can legitimize that. Okay. Because that was just bugging the shit out of me, because I didn't want to... I didn't want to make it seem like Batman is just killing him. Right. Because, I mean, that would be incredibly out of character for him to do so. Yeah. I mean, honestly, and I also, felt that way. Also, even if that pisses anybody off, that's like, there are going to be people that creates an argument. That creates, well, it, it, there's, I, I know there's always going to be that, but, but I don't but want I, it to be I a like that. major that, thing. That's what good art does. That puts, after this movie, there's going to be a, a camp of people that could say, well, technically Bruce just killed him. And then the other people that could say, no. Bruce had every right to do what he did, and he didn't technically kill him. And that is, like, that's why, like, I mean, I'm just going to use this argument. That's why Lost lives on so well, is because there's an empirical argument that happened after the finale of that show as to why that finale was allowed to happen. And then there's another, it's, it's an extremely divisive finale of, like, there's a camp of people, my friend Mike being an extreme one of them, of, like, that show should not have done that, and here are all the reasons why. And the fact that there's a conversation still going on three years... Today was the three-year anniversary of that finale, of the Lost finale ending. Really? Really? Yeah. That's a weird coincidence. May, May 23rd, 2010. And the fact that that argument is still going on means that it's great art. The fact that you can still argue 50 years later how much of an asshole... Uh, What's his name? Citizen Kane. 
lead character in Citizen Kane. Yeah, I don't remember, but I know yeah, what you're he, talking about. yeah, like whether he's gay or not, whether that's the source of his frustration, whether like he, gay for the man penis. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> leaving room for an argument is okay because we have our own way of looking at it. We think it's legitimate, and in that moment, Bruce is reacting. Bruce isn't thinking. There is too much at stake to do anything but react. Mm-hmm. He's he's seen the science. He knows this guy. His only goal is to stop what's happening. That's how I legitimize all of this. Okay. All right. All right. I I'll mean, buy that. It, it, there's a there's a very there's one thing I respected a whole lot that like happened mid uh, towards the end of season six of Lost that. A bunch of people hated that one character made a decision that affected the life of another character and a lot of people hate that decision but like the creators were like look everything happened in this character's life to lead him to this moment to make this decision and you can't argue that in from his perspective he can't make that decision he made that decision and you're gonna have to live with it regardless of what happened to the other characters and that that is cool character development to me that which we can totally apply to batman and Raish in this instance Mm -hmm. sorry i use lost (laughs) as a metaphor for everything it's It's good i worked that show okay okay so i'll buy that okay so we've got what animal do we want bruce to take back to the Batcave? i'm I'm thinking if it's some sort of pet, I'm, I'm actually thinking that he might not take an animal if he can just take the blood sample with him. It would be a lot easier to carry a blood sample anyway. That's true. You wouldn't have to steal someone's pet. Right, I'm thinking if he finds... I, I sort of like the idea, you know, the family dog just sitting there like does, like he doesn't give a shit. Mm-hmm. Right. I like that too. It's fun. You know, and, and he gets... You know, it's a little fun moment in yeah. light of the fact that two or three million people just died horribly. Horrible deaths. Yeah. What I'm going to have to do at some point, because I like the number between six and eight hundred million people as the death toll of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Which means that now, of course, this will never be published, but I want to be sure on the math here because... I would have to figure out how many major cities and which ones would need to be wiped out to amass that sort of population death. Right. Because you have these large cities, like Paris is a really large city compared to just the world in general, and that's only got like three million people in it. I mean, hell, I've lived in cities with more than a million people, and I think think the population of Akron, Ohio was a... Yeah, I think it was like 950,000, but... I'm just trying to think if there's anything else Abaddon related we need to um has so has Race just I'm sure Race has just taken the time over the past few hundred years to just mass produce this Black Plague thing to get ready for this or has he just sort of had some supply of it and been tinkering with it to figure out some way thinking to do a combination this. of those things and also figuring out how to disperse it Mm-hmm. Which we had trouble with, right? But he would have had more trouble with because he actually had to fucking do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he'll never have to explain the science behind those fucking balls, right? In fact, they almost explain themselves. Yeah, sort of. And that's a good thing. Something that, yeah. Well, we've got over an hour on Project Batman. Really? Yep. Compared with yeah, how much we have, let's so let's get to the point. Mm-hmm. We got like uh, about an hour and a half now, so I'm gonna say this lead-in line, and I'm gonna see if you guys know the Dark Knight well enough to give the proper response. It's a funny world we live in. Speaking of which, do you know how I got these scars? No, but I know how you got these. <laughs> there we go. Well done. <laughs> <laughs>